Hello, government students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 5, Section 1, Congressional Membership. So we're going to get started here, and we're going to talk a little bit about the membership in the House and the Senate. And one of the things I want you to look at very carefully is on the top of your sheet that you have, uh, you probably have the dates for the 115th Congress. And what I want to talk about is the 116th Congress, which we're in right now, uh, began basically in January of 2019 and will end in December of 2020. And what we're going to look at is basically the makeup uh, of both males and females. And then when we talk about political party, um, you know, numbers of Democrats and Republicans and independents uh, that are in, in either the House of Representatives and the Senate. But before we begin that, I want you to write down a few quick numbers. And the first number that you need to know is that there are 435 seats available in the House of Representatives and 100 seats available in the U.S. Senate. Uh, combined, there's 535 members of Congress. That includes both House and Senate. Um, that does not include representatives that might go and observe from the territories. So we're not including uh, numbers from Puerto Rico or the Virgin U.S. Virgin Islands and the United States Samoa and, and such. Um, but to start with, I want to talk a little bit about the breakup or the makeup uh, based on gender. Uh, the 116th Congress actually is kind of a unique one because we have seen more women uh, than ever that have been part of either the House or the Senate. So in the House of Representatives, there are 101 women or roughly 23 percent of the makeup of the House is women. Uh, for the uh, the males out there, it was 351. That's roughly 77 percent. Now, uh, when we talk about the Senate, women make up 26 percent or 26 percent. Um, in count and males make up for or 74 percent or 74 in number counts how does this break down by the parties well there are roughly uh 232 democrats that are in the house of representatives and 197 uh republicans uh that changed in 2019 as a result of the 2018 uh midterm elections where um Republicans had once been uh, in control of the House, lost it to the Democrats, and now the Democrats have the majority. Uh, there are roughly five vacancies that are up, and uh, for the most part, that would be probably determined by a governor of the state of that person that is um, vacated the seat. Uh, there is one independent currently in the House of Representatives. When we look at the Senate, 45 uh, senators are Democrats, 53 are Republicans, meaning that the Republicans are in the majority. What's interesting is there are two independents. One of them would include um, Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont. Uh, he is non-committed as far as his political leanings, though uh, he was running as a Democrat or is running as a Democrat in 2020. So uh, needless to say, it's kind of interesting to, to break it down by numbers. If you were going to look at a map here, uh, the bigger map that we have to start with is the U.S. Senate. Uh, states that are in red uh, basically have both U.S. senators that are of the same political party, meaning that they are Republican. States that are blue have both senators that are Democrat. States that are kind of uh, in between, meaning that they have both a Republican and a Democrat or colored purple, to kind of give you that idea. And you can kind of see where that's. Uh, at here in the United States. And then we've got a couple of states that have got the weird stripes. And that basically means that uh, the state of Maine and the state of Vermont have independent senators. Otherwise, the other senator is either of the uh, Republican Party in Maine or of the Democratic Party in Vermont. Okay. Looking at uh, the House of Representatives, this is actually as of 2018 and that election. And you can see that members of the House of Representatives from Nebraska are all Republican. 
Uh, if you look carefully, you can kind of see the different legislative districts that are out there. Um, if you look at our neighbors, uh, South Dakota, they only have one representative and obviously that person must be a Republican. Uh, state of Kansas, uh, all of them are Republicans except for the one representative that comes from the Kansas City metropolitan area. Uh, if you look at Colorado, uh, pretty much all Republicans except for the one representative that is representing kind of the, the mountain zone of the northern part of uh, Colorado. This is where you would find some of your ski resorts of like Breckenridge and, and such. Um, if you look at Iowa, uh, uh, they have uh, a little mix. They've got a um, basically a Republican uh, that represents the, the northwestern part of the state. And if you look towards the south and the east part of the state, uh, pretty much Democrats, though I, I would have to say my, my folks being from the southwest corner of Iowa, uh, not so happy about the fact that their um, representative is actually from Des Moines, um, very different in mindset than maybe those folks that are living in the rural part of the state. So needless to say, you can kind of see how that broken down. I might give you an idea of maybe where you're seeing a lot of Democrats. Democrats have a tendency to, to kind of have um, a hold over the areas that are what I would call metropolitan areas, uh, opposed to the rural part of the country, which is predominantly Republican, which is kind of a, an interesting way to look at it. As far as like the background of our members of Congress, uh, you can take a look here uh, based on occupations. Uh, not necessarily very many people who are involved in agriculture when we talk about the Democratic Party. Um, we've got a few more of them that are um, Republicans that are involved in agriculture. Uh, clergy, predominantly more that are uh, Republican leaning opposed to Democratic leaning. Um, if you go down further into areas of like uh, law enforcement and medicine, you can kind of see how that breaks down as far as um, political leaning and such. What I think is interesting is this other um, graph that you have on the other side. There are quite a few members of Congress that have degrees in law. And if you take a look at the different law schools that some of these uh, members of Congress are coming out of, uh, you can see that Harvard Law predominantly is producing more politicians per capita than maybe some of the other law schools around our nation. Uh, but that's one thing to, to keep in the back of your mind. A lot of folks that go into uh, studying law and getting a degree in law uh, aren't necessarily always becoming lawyers. A lot of them do go into other fields and politics just happens to be one of those uh, that you do see a lot of politicians going into. All right, qualifications. These are things that I hope are review. Um, if you go back a, a couple chapters ago, we, we talked a little bit about the Constitution and you guys did a scavenger hunt where you were breaking down uh, some of the requirements. And when you talk about the requirements for both the House and the Senate, they kind of look similar except for a few age requirement issues. Uh, to be a member of the House, you had to be at least 25. To be in the Senate, you had to be at least 30. And our founding fathers thought that, you know, 30 years of age, a person would probably have reached uh, a certain maturity uh, that certainly would make them a little more, um, I guess you could say, um, conscientious of the societal needs than maybe members of the House. Uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen for at least a certain number of years. If you're a member of the House, it's a minimum of seven years. If you're a senator, it's going to be a member, uh, minimum of nine. You also have to be a legal resident uh, of your district or state, depending. So if I'm um, running for the House of Representatives, I need to live in the district that I'm going to represent. Or if I'm a senator, it doesn't matter where in the state, as long as I am from that state, uh, then I can go ahead and run, regardless of exactly where within the state I live. Term of office, House of Representatives only serve two-year terms, so every two years they're up for re-election. So 2018 was our last election, 2020 will be our next election that we're going to have in November, and then again in 2022, and then 2024. So they're constantly really being uh, re-evaluated and constantly having to run for re-election. 
in the Senate every six years. And what's interesting is how the Senate breaks that down. A third of the U.S. Senate will be up for election in any given election year. So in 2018, a third of the U.S. Senate was up for re-election, though none of our our um, senators from Nebraska were up for re-election that year. This year um, is an election year for Ben Sass. Uh, he's going to be running again. So needless to say, it's, it's kind of interesting how that works, but it's roughly every six years. Salary, uh, unless you are kind of special and you have a kind of a prestigious position here, an average member of the House or the Senate is going to earn around $174,000 a year. Uh, that may change one day. Uh, the members of Congress may vote themselves a pay raise, but if you remember the 27th Amendment, they had to wait till after an election to collect. Uh, Speaker of the House earns $223,500, and the President pro temper, uh, which would be currently um, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, he earns $193,400. Pensions. Pension is kind of interesting, but you know, on the the maximum end, uh, if a member has been or a member of Congress has been in office for, I think, I think it's over like, you know, six years, maybe, maybe even two terms. If you're talking about the Senate, maybe 12 years, they can earn up to $50,000 a year. Now, if you are a member of the House and you only serve for two years, you're not going to get that $50,000 per year. But needless to say, that's pretty good money coming out of a pension. That certainly uh, allows some people to live fairly comfortably. The presiding officer, meaning the, the highest officer of each of these different houses, Speaker of the House, uh, which if you remember the line of, su of succession, that's third in line to become president. Uh, that would be Nancy Pelosi. That is the, the head leader of the House. The vice president, Mike Pence, uh, he would be the leader of the Senate, though he doesn't necessarily have to spend a lot of time in the U.S. Senate. Um, occasionally he is brought there to lobby senators or maybe even to break a tie uh, when that matters. But most of the time, yeah, he's he's probably dealing with other issues. Other leaders, and this goes for both the House and the Senate, there are majority leaders and minority leaders depending on which political party is in power. So uh, currently in the House of Representatives, the majority leader is going to be of the Democratic Party and the minority leader is going to be of the Republican Party. If you're in the, the Senate, the majority leader is going to be a Republican. The minority leader is going to be a Democrat. So uh, each party has whips, and a whip, for the most part, uh, helps the majority leader as far as um, getting people wound up and, and excited about voting for certain issues. So they're, they're kind of an assistant to the majority leader in the sense. All right, average age, you don't necessarily need to write this down, but our average age of our U.S. members of the House of Representatives is about 57, going on 58 years of age. Uh, average tenure, meaning that how many years do they serve in office? Not quite nine, about 8.6 years on average. Uh, for average age of senators, not quite 63, just very close to that. And average tenure is around 10 years. Uh, when we talk about religious denominations, Roman Catholics do account for the largest um, single domination as far as um, religion is concerned. But there are a lot of Protestants, uh, just of varying different um, denominations. So you may have Methodists, you may have Baptists and, and Lutherans and such. So just to kind of give you an idea, we do have uh, Hindus and Muslims um, serving in Congress as well. So just something to keep in mind. Anyway, uh, and number one here, what's the most important function Congress performs? And the big function that they do is they um, initiate and approve new laws. In other words, they're trying to write legislation. They're trying to write uh, new laws for our nation. Now, uh, to get those approved, they obviously have to get the support of the president unless they can uh, manage to override a presidential veto. But we'll talk more about that. Uh, number two, what's the relationship between the congressional terms and sessions? Well, a congressional term is every two years, and that includes one two-year session. So 
Uh, we are currently in the 116th session of Congress. And that session of Congress basically lasts, um, basically, or that term will last two years. Uh, we are in the second session of that. So 2019 was the first, and now 2020 is the second. What's the relationship between congressional appropriation and redistricting? Well, this is why we're doing a census in 2020. Uh, this helps determine uh, where people are living and where we need to have more or less representatives uh, in the House of Representatives. So reapportionment is that process, and it takes place after each census. Uh, since the House of Representatives is based on populations, new districts may have to be drawn up as a result, and sometimes a state will gain a representative, and sometimes states will lose representatives, and sometimes nothing will change. But, um, you know, there have been states uh, that have gained quite a few representatives over the years. You look at California in the last 50 years, even 60 years, uh, their population has definitely soared. And so if you went back really to, um, you know, a time maybe back in the middle of the 20th century, uh, they had less than 25 representatives. Uh, you look at them today, they have well over 55. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing to look at. Now, is it possible that California at some point in time might see a change, meaning that we lose representation? You never know. It could happen. But for right now, they have quite a bit of power. Um, congressional membership. As far as representatives, we've mentioned some of these before. They have to be at least 25, a citizen for at least seven years, legal resident of the state and the district that they represent. They serve a two-year term. They are elected by a district. Uh, representation is apportioned by the population. So um, Nebraska, the second congressional district, is kind of the metropolitan area of Omaha where Don Bacon serves, and it's two counties. We look at the, the first congressional district of Nebraska, which is kind of the eastern third of Nebraska with the exception of the Omaha metro area. Um, yeah, a little bigger, but um, the third congressional district is basically from a line west of Columbus all the way to the state of Wyoming. So uh, a very large congressional district in the United States in comparison to um, some states where those districts are relatively small. Uh, senators, they have to be at least 30. U.S. citizen for nine years, legal resident of the state, have to serve a six-year term. They're elected at large, meaning the entire state votes for them. And there's two from every state. Now, before we go on any further, I, I do want to mention a few things about our legislative branches of our state government. Uh, if you take a look at this map, you notice that Nebraska is kind of in the gray. And that basically means that we have a nonpartisan uh, legislature in the state of Nebraska. In other words, uh, we don't technically have a political party that dominates. In comparison to, let's say, Iowa, which predominantly is Republican at their state level, um, you look at Colorado, it's kind of a split. Look at New Mexico, it's predominantly Democrats. Needless to say, um, that kind of shows you how that, that breakdown is at the state level. All right, thank you very much.